1 Peter 5, 6 and 7, it admonishes us and helps us because our humanity, our humanity is our biggest problem. My problems isn't with, with you or anybody around me. Those issues still stem from me. When my pride gets in the way of being who I need to be for you instead of who I want you to be for me. Humble yourselves, therefore, under the mighty hand of God. We don't like being under anybody's hand. Just ask some of these kids around here, these teenagers. That he may exalt you in due time. We miss that part. Why do I want to submit to God? You see, if you can become submissive to God, there's nothing he'll withhold from you. Casting all your care upon him, for he careth for you. How many times when we found out too late and we've mistreated someone, not realizing that they weren't trying to hurt us, they were trying to help us. And they were just trying to care about us and we misplaced it. Acts 17. that they should seek the Lord. See, that's corny today to some people. We've been taught to be our own gods, our own divine orchestrators of our lives. and I'll do it my way. But we miss out on so much that they should seek the Lord and happily they might feel after Him and find Him though he be not far from any one of us. I, I, I think one of the greatest travesties of, of the, on the other side will be how close and how available God has been to you. But you refuse to hear, to see, and you missed it. Because whether you acknowledge him or not, and we're the, the worst sinner, the worst murderer, or whatever, don't even realize that in him we live and move and we have our being. As certain also of our own poets have said, for we are also his offspring. No one is on this planet that God doesn't know about, that God didn't create. Every person that you see from the beggar on the street corner to the CEO upset of your existence and the position on the freeway hindering them to get to their all-important job. The world spins on its axis and has done so for many years. Humanity has come and gone. There are really only two kinds of people. It's not divided up by races, colors, and creeds. And it's divided by those that will be lost and those that will be in heaven. If you'll place your Bibles down, let's talk to our Creator right now, and maybe with some humility. Ask God to help us realign ourselves with Him today. Jesus, we love you and we need you. Lord, I'm frail. That's proven many times over that a microscopic germ that I can't even see can make me bedridden, that a simple misstep can cause me to fall, break some ribs. God, I pray right now that you allow each and every one of us to enter into your presence today and learn of you that our minds and our hearts would be drawn to a place to receive from you, God, what we need from you. Each and every person is different. Each and every person here has a different need. And if they're in a different place, a different spot. But you're able to meet that need to whoever will feel after you today. Help us through our humanity to touch divinity in Jesus' name. And everybody said amen. Amen. God bless you. You can be seated. All three of the synoptic gospels show Jesus 
recruiting a third of his disciples after being tempted by Satan. Most of the time, growth is determined by the battles we win privately, not by the impressions and efforts we make publicly. You are where you are by what you really are. You can come in here and put on a suit or a nice dress and act one way, but in all honesty, you are in the position you're in because of what you are privately. <sighs> people that haven't found the Lord, people that are in the shadows need leaders or Christians who win the battle in the shadows. Each and every one of us will be measured by the Lord, by our efforts when it comes to heaven and hell, not bank accounts and buildings. Distraction is the destruction of your dreams in slow motion. Those things that keep you from becoming who God called you to be. There's a lot of things we want to do and like to do, but in order to be spiritual, we have to start each day with a conference of our Creator. And if you go long periods of time without actually speaking to Him, it's going to be very hard to do what He's asked you to do. Personal Christian growth and development demands that we change from going to church to being the church. As much as we'd like to today, we, we want to erase or admit or get rid of the church concept. I don't have to go to church to be saved, or I don't need a church to be right with God. I definitely don't need a pastor or church folks, but yet that would be like Noah saying, I'm going to survive the flood without building the ark. You're not. Society wants to tell you, but that's not what God tells us, because the Holy Ghost is a spiritual concept. We like to think that we can prove spirituality by physical success. Listen, when you resist the Holy Spirit, you grieve the Holy Spirit. And in grieving the Holy Spirit, you will then quench the Holy Spirit right out of your life. It's an undeniable concept that you can't be spiritual without the Holy Spirit. You can put on ceremony. Hello? A genuine Christian needs focus, discipline, and determination. We don't just haphazardly become great Christians or highly spiritual. The ability to say no to worldly distractions and yes to doing God's will is well worth the effort and will be obvious. Are you hearing me? In the last days, the concern of leadership or leaders will become, what do the people want to hear? That's what's happening, folks. You can go in every church corner, and there are a lot of churches that merely are trying to say what they think you want to hear. Look, when I was, and I'll be on last Monday when it was looking bad, I, believe it or not, I almost couldn't speak for two days there. In fact, I, someone called me on the third day. I was just, I think it was Brother Corey. I could barely even use my voice. My, my wife and Erica was coming in there, and they were, they were pounding on me on do this. You got to do that. We got to get you this. We got to get you that. And. You know, it was it was disturbing my my peace as I was lay, laying there writhing in the agony of that was me. <laughs> yeah, it wasn't looking so great then. But it wasn't what I wanted to hear, but the fight was to get me to do what needed I needed to do. 
And sadly, we live in a world today where there are churches that are going to tell you everything you want to hear rather than what God wants them to say. That's, that's the reality. See, being a good parent is going to cause you to be at odds with your children. Being a good employer means there's going to be times you're going to tell the employee, we have to do it this way. But we're so proud now that we want to instruct God. We want to instruct. We, our world is turned upside down because they made, a, they made a huge mistake. We don't need the children to lead. We need the parents to lead the children so they can become good leaders. That's right. You don't ask a five-year-old what he wants for dinner. You give him what he needs for dinner. You know, the last thing a little boy needs today is told he needs to be given chemicals to change his gender. Man, give him a Tonka truck, a car, a shovel, put him in the dirt. He'll figure it out. Give the little girl some Barbies or whatever. Let her, let her do that kind of. Let her go out to be men and women instead of confused and killing themselves. You know that those people of that persuasion have a 40% suicide rate. Yeah, I'm not going to promote that. I still believe God's the best way. It's a revelation. So many Christians today are running back to the bondage of Egypt and they're calling it freedom and it's like drinking poison and calling it refreshing. In Luke 16, I'm going to read something to you. Here's a man that would seem like a success story. He had everything he could want. In fact, he had so much, he decided to tear down what he had to build bigger. But he makes a statement after the Lord deals with him and says, Thou fool, today your soul is required of you, and then who will those things be? And it says in Luke 16, 27 and 28, and he said, I pray thee therefore, Father, that thou wouldest send him to my father's house, for I have five brethren that he may testify unto them, lest they also come into this place of torment. Wow. Here's a man that had everything in the world that was sent to hell asking the Lord to send the least successful person he knew in life to his brethren. That doesn't go with what we see in society today. Here's someone asking God to Send a beggar to his family to reach them. Here's someone in hell wanting to see the lost saved. If you read in Luke 15 and 7, it says, I say unto you, that likewise joy shall be in heaven over one sinner that repenteth, than over the 99 just persons which need no repentance. Now we know hell wants to see the lost saved, and now we just read heaven wants to see the lost saved. If you go to Mark 5, it says, and they come to Jesus and see him that was possessed with the devil. Remember the crazy man that was naked, running around in the tombs, cutting himself and acting crazy? They're saying, man, look, look at this guy here. He was possessed with the devil. He had a legion sitting, and now he's clothed and in his right mind. And they were afraid of him. Now, see, some of you haven't experienced that, but my family experienced that. When they watched me come out of the world that I came out of, they, they literally said, we liked you better when you was dealing drugs and now that you're talking about this Jesus. That was literally said to me. We liked you better when you were like that. We liked you better bound when you, I mean, I'm dodging bullets. I got crazy stuff going on in my life. And I literally had family members say, we liked you better that way than this way. And so here's Jesus. He's just, he's just done a work on one of the most prominent bad guys in the society. This guy was so bad that they, they chained him up. But let's listen to what Jesus says to him. Jesus was fixing to leave, and they began to, to pray him to depart out of their coast. We want you out of here, Jesus. And when he was coming to the ship, he that had been possessed with the devil prayed him that he might be with them. Jesus, I want to go with you. Here's this man that's just been delivered. Here's this man that's just gotten freedom from, from the world and the chains and the bondage, from everybody looking at him like he was out of his mind. I want to go with you, Jesus. But Jesus suffered him not. 
In other words, Jesus didn't let them. He said to them, go home to thy friends. Tell them how great things the Lord hath done for thee and hath had compassion on thee. What's he saying? You see, see, I basically read to you that 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 the that, that hell wants to see the lost saved. Heaven wants to see the lost saved. Jesus wants to see the lost saved. There's something about uh, heaven and hell and the world. That there's a whole lot going on when you're really looking at things right. You want to see the lost saved. But what's happened today? What has happened where those of us that have experienced the truth, we've, we've been baptized in Jesus' name. We've, we, we repented and we got our lives right and we, we've been filled with, we, we're baptized in the name, Holy Ghost filled, and we find ourselves on a seat. And then the most concern we have now is, what's for dinner? What am I going to wear? How many likes did I get on my Facebook? How, how much money I got in the bank? How, how much, and as Christians, we become spiritually anemic. Second Timothy, Paul is, is writing to his number one charge, the one that he is concerned about being and maintaining and remaining spiritual. He is saying in 2 Timothy 3, 1, 3, this know also that in the last days perilous times shall come, for men shall be lovers of their own selves. Let me tell you, he's talking to Timothy who's going to be working with the church. He's telling him the type of people that are going to be churchgoers in the last days. Lovers of your own selves. Covetous. No, no, no. Listen, listen. You can't measure it by how you think of yourself. You have to measure yourself how much you care about the lost. How consumed are you about the lost? Listen. Covetous, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful unholy, without natural affection, truth breakers, false accusers, incontinent, fierce, despisers of those that are good, traitors, heady, high-minded, lovers of pleasures more than lovers of God, having a form of God. No, 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 they got a form of godliness, but denying the power thereof from such turn away. What concerns you today? What are you concerned about today? Lacey, I hope this doesn't embarrass you. I look for you every service. But don't let you make you feel good because I look for every one of you. I tell you what, I also look to see who's in the altar and who's not. I also look around. When's the last time I've heard them speak in tongues, if ever? Because I have a concern for the lost. Now, granted, I kind of hold a position that you kind of need to think about that. A <laughs> you know, I, I, you know, when the writer said, "Oh, when I preach to others, and I myself become a castaway," what's he talking about? Losing a burden for the lost. How could you ever call yourself a pastor, a leader, a Christian, a born again? How do you become a castaway? You forget your burden for the very important thing that's engulfed heaven and hell because they're concerned about the lost. They're thinking about the lost. They want to reach the lost. I read to you in Luke, the greatest concern of hell. In Luke 15, the greatest concern of heaven. And Mark 5, the greatest concern of the earth is the lost. These things are really all tied together. The greatest concern of hell are souls. The greatest concern of heaven is souls, and the greatest concern of the church is souls. The greatest responsibility of Christians on this earth, beyond our own personal relationship before God and our families, is souls. If you want to check your litmus test of salvation, check your litmus test of how you care about those that are lost. How can a doctor not care about the sick? 
How, how, could, how could a nurse be ambivalent towards the hurting? How can a mother give no regard to her child? It doesn't make sense. So how can a Christian be a Christian with no concern for the lost? What consumes you? What 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 concerns you today? What as a, as a born again, heaven bound, Holy Ghost filled believer? What concerns you? Because that tells you where you're at spiritually. You may not like the outcome, but rather than deny it, look at it, embrace it, and change it. The rich man gives us one of our only views from hell, or gives us the view of being eternally lost. Because we can learn a lot from someone. He's been there. The rich man in hell had two concerns. His first was self-preservation. Just send Lazarus to touch my tongue with a bit of water. Let me tell you something. Go, go, go. just go on a fast. I mean, from everything. Some of these kids, they can't drink something. They got to have soda. They got to have Kool-Aid. They gotta, it's got to have I can't drink water. Go without anything. You'll, you'll, you'll go a day. Go a day and a half. Go two days. Boy, you'd be guzzling. You'd even eat ice chips. See, the problem is we're so spoiled with so much junk that we no longer appreciate that that is vital. You see, you can have a lot of stuff, Brother Lawrence, and your life's so filled with stuff that just coming to church is coming and finding your seat. But when you realize this is vital, you're not just going to come and find your seat, but you're not, you're, every worship song is going to mean everything to you. Every altar call is going to be, let me get my spot there. Every time a preacher or an evangelist or someone gets up and talks about the goodness of God, it's going to get your attention because you're consumed with what Christianity really is. You can't go a day without realizing someone will be lost. Someone will be saved. Let me get in on this thing. Let me have an effect. You see, in the dialogue with the rich man in hell, this Abraham, of course, assured him there was no way he could be released. And that lets us know that once a person dies, once his body dies, his character and his condition is fixed. It's set. Intentions cannot be well. I intended to be. I intend. I wanted to. If I knew they wanted me, I'd have knocked on. If, if I knew that's what you wanted, I'd be more involved in church. If, if I can, I tell you something. Some of you, you and I, we've all. How many signed a contract before you didn't read all the fine print? And use all in because you wanted that house or you wanted that car or you got that credit card. Jesus didn't give us any fine print. It's all in black, white, and red. You ain't going to be able to turn around. I didn't know. Oh, yeah, you did this right there. I, I didn't hide nothing with little microscopic words at the end there. I didn't give it all that. I went ahead and went to Calvary and I shed my blood and I did it all. And you're going to turn around and get all fine print attitude with me. You better get all in. Oh, where, where we get all serious about our finances and our health and our doctors and all. And we turn around and treat church or treat heaven. Hell, ah. Lovers of pleasures more than lovers of God. Church, that, that, that's a syndrome we have to deal with. It's easy to blow off the things of God because there's not an immediate repercussion for being wrong. We become lackadaisical, nonchalant, and, and we, we end up, well, I'm in my, I made it to church. Whoa. Really? 
Jesus could say, well, I, 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 I made it up too. I, 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 what, you, what, you want me to answer your prayer too? Oh, what? Oh, well, now I got to make sure you have food in your house and I, I, yeah, I got to make sure that there's groceries in your refrigerator. Can, can, I be, can I say something? What if God treated us like we treated him? What if God treated us with the same intensity that we treat him? How many's glad he's a good God? If you're so quick to tout what you've done, you're in trouble. Because can I ask you, do you really think your resume impresses him? So what we learned is there was no parole for this guy. There was no reprieve. There was no, okay, we're going we're gonna to give you another chance. We're going to let you out on furlough. There, there's no appeal. His character, his condition was permanent. It was set. It's, it was fixed forever. He didn't love God with all his heart, mind, soul, and spirit on earth. And he ain't going to love God in hell either. He didn't repent on earth. And you ain't going to repent there either. So as a person dies, so just make sure, can I say this? Make sure you, want, you are today who you want to be for eternity. Oh, yeah. You are teaching some elders around here. So that ought to make every one of us stand up. Oh, God. Oh, God. Ha, I'm sick in my body. Ah, you better believe I'm going to get a hold of God today. I may see him tomorrow. You got to make sure. Oh, I'm going to be in that altar. I don't care what, what y'all think about me. You can think I got the grossest sin in life. I don't give a, a rip. I'm going to be there because my relationship with him matters more than what my relationship with you matters. Oh, God, I, I, God, help me to try to treat you how you treat me like you're the whole world. But something quickly overpowered what happened there because as, as soon as he realized he couldn't get out, then he wanted to make sure his brothers never came in. Oh, I, I wonder if we could get that view today. I wonder if we could get that concern. And, you know, if, oh, there, I, I, no matter what, oh, I can't allow my brothers to get here. He had five brothers on earth. And he now knew, I, oh, I don't want him coming here. Sadly, I, I, I made the statement when I was in high school. I, we used to joke as we used to sneak out back behind the, the gymnasium between the swimming pool and hide in that little area there back there in old high school. We used to sit there and smoke our dope. And, yeah, we get to hell. We'll just sit around smoking weed with that. <laughs> I ain't know, I know none of y'all never did that. The long hair, my stupid rock concert T-shirts. Oh, that was good, right? That was good. That was good, bud, man. Uh, Go meander back to class. Oh, I'm cutting on you. Yeah, okay, let's go. Let's go. See, some some people foolishly think you're going to have plenty of company in hell. Let me tell you something. You're going to be weeping, wailing, and gnashing your teeth. Ain't there going to be no party down there. It's going to be hate and hurt because it's going to be the absence of God. Make sure that you're not making the absence of God in your life permanent. If you haven't been in an altar, and if you haven't found yourself flowing in the, and, the, and the conduit for the Holy Ghost and the power of God, you, you better, man, let me get there now. Because he didn't spend all the time getting the hell out of heaven. They're going to let it back in because of you. Are you hearing what I'm saying? Can I tell you the power of this is that he, even people in hell don't want anyone to come there. Only idiots on this side who think it's a party think, ah, it's all good. Those in hell say, oh, don't come here. Oh, don't come here. Why is there screaming in hell right now? Why, 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 why would there... I believe in hell, the screams are, hell is screaming for the church to get serious for soul winning. 
those in hell are screaming that we would be doing what we're supposed to be doing, that we would really truly see Christ robed in flesh, reaching for the lost. To be Christ-like means we must be reaching for the lost. We wouldn't want anybody to go to hell. We don't want anybody of our own family to go there. I believe the greatest screams from hell today are for the church to get serious about souls. The rich man said, I want you to do something. I want you to see that my five brothers get saved so they don't come here. I don't want them to come where I'm at. He, he didn't want his brothers to go there. Even if, even if it cost him their company, I don't want my brothers with me. I don't want my family here. Yeah, I, I do anything. Don't let anybody I know come here. I'd rather suffer alone in eternity than to think that any one of my family would come here. What kind of place is hell if the people who are there don't want to see anyone else come to that terrible place? I don't want my friends here. I don't want my family. There ought to be something that consumes us about reaching the lost. We ought to, we ought to ask God, ah, don't forget your lost condition. Don't, don't forget just because you got a couple of bucks in the bank. You know how to use deodorant. Get your hair straightened out and, and get living for God. Don't think you made it because don't think, don't forget it and become indifferent to the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. The rich have to snare. Being in America alone gives us a snare. We're too comfortable. Knowing that we must conclude the greatest concern of hell is for Christians on earth to reach for sinners. The greatest concern of hell is so when, and think about it, why is it that he now has such an interest in his brother's salvation? When he didn't have any concern when he was on earth, he, he had all the money at his disposal so much he was building bigger barns. He, he doesn't even think about spending a dime to see them. Oh, let me, oh, you know what, I, I, I'm going to take some of this money and go visit my brothers and talk to them about Jesus. Let me tell you something. There's, a, there's, a, there's an opiate to the success in this, and especially in America. There's a reason they're able to get away with it. If you're upset at what's going on politically, that's not to get you to become political. You better get spiritual. Yeah. Don't, don't, don't get upset about what they're doing. Get upset that it's not affecting you properly. If it's not driving you to prayer and to reach for someone, you've missed it. You've missed it. He was doing so well. He was financially set for, for many years. So do, do take thine ease. But it's funny, but now in hell he's concerned. What happened? What happened between the moment when he when he stood back and looked at all he had and the success? Yeah, Brother Jonathan, just think about it. He had everything. He probably just drew a war suit, just like you and I. Guys. Now I'm the envy of my neighbors. He'll stand around with the other men. They are, oh, yeah, I know more than him. I done better. Yo, know, I done well. Come on, ladies. Come on. You, got, you suffer from the same syndrome. But what happened between building bigger barns? And seeking to see his family saved. I can tell you what it is. It, 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 he's now finally convinced. He finally realized, he's convinced, there is judgment. And now he's concerned. When you get convinced, you'll be concerned. Yeah. I said, when you get convinced, you'll get concerned. Ah, oh, man, I preach something flowery. Man. You don't need nothing flowery. You need something to get, stir your faith. Now get your backside out of your chair. Lift your hand. Oh, I need you, Jesus. I need you, God. He now knows from personal experience that there's a burning hell for people to spend eternity. We got to get convinced. Because when we get convinced, we'll be concerned. 
You got to get convinced and you'll be concerned. That knowledge made him want to see his brother saved above anything else. More than anything else, it became his greatest concern. Even in his permanent torturous position, his greatest concern was reaching the lost. Oh, what can we learn today from this man? The Bible gives, gives us a pretty clear picture that my God, if someone in hell wants to evangelize to get the world into the church, what ought a church ought to be acting? If you, how are you going to be acting today? What do you think you should be praying out this morning? How do you think you should be acting? Obviously, prior to this, he didn't fully believe. He was not persuaded that there was a judgment to face when he was on earth, or he would have been concerned about himself and his brother's salvation and not wanting more. Isn't it funny how we want more? And it, it, he wanted more. He wanted bigger buildings and more business ventures, another project, another. And he was so busy with the things of this world that he traded heaven for the world. And he didn't get neither. I have a question to ask you. Why is it that a majority of Christians, especially in the U.S., are really not interested or truly concerned in reaching people for Jesus Christ on a personal basis? Let me tell you something. I, 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 I've suffered from... I've dealt with, if you've dealt with cancer, you ever been around a doctor that works with cancer? They're concerned. If, if you've been around children that are lost or hurting, you get around someone like Sister Peaches or the school, you realize, man, they care. There's something about caring when you're, you can't stand to see that. You watch, you see, you, you, you watch this little Nimi start crying in every mother in the place. And it, ain't, it doesn't even matter if it's been years and years and years ago that you had them. That, uh-uh, there's something about that cry. There's something about that. If there was a, if the, if there was a crowd of, of us here, and, I, and there's so many that I had to yell out your name, and there's 15 people in the crowd, with this, and I yelled that name out, all those people would turn. You're concerned. It's your name. What am I talking about here? The answer has to be that we have reached the point that even in the church, we are no longer really convinced that there's a judgment to face or a hell where people will spend eternity. Yep, yeah, yeah. yeah. Now listen, I, we may intellectually have an understanding of the concept. We know it exists as a doctrine or teaching in the Bible. We, we accept it as truth in theory, on paper. We say we believe it because we're supposed to believe it. I get you I get a couple of golf claps. And a, Amen. Amen. That's right. Praise the Lord. Amen. Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. But our actions declare otherwise. We sit there unmoved and, and we, we, we sit there unconcerned that there may be somebody in the audience today that is sitting on the precipice between coming and going, heaven or hell. We, we sit there indifferent because we think, and we, we, do, we do the quick uh, accounting of, well, 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 no, the bills are paid and, and we're going to have uh, this for lunch and we're going to do this and every, all these things. You checked all those boxes. But you miss the same one the man building yeah. bigger barns did. Come on. Come on. Come on. Because our actions look more like what Paul pointed out in 2 Timothy 3, 1 through 8, having a form of godliness, but denying it. Denying the power. What am I talking about when I say power? If that boy started crying, and I don't mean to pick on you, Brother Corey. And you couldn't get him. Every, one, every woman in this place like, give him to me. Because ain't no one can shut up a baby like a mama. Guys, 
you just we, we ain't built we ain't soft like them we ain't built like them we got these big old cruddy hands and a, a baby nose was being held by a loving mama and a, and a loving dad it just ain't the same same works in the spirit world because in reality if we truly believe that a person is going to spend eternity in a burning hell there's no way we could be around them or see them or know them and not want to do something about it to keep them from you got a baby about to fall and hurt itself there ain't a decent person in here ain't willing to run and stop that baby that baby may kick and scream and one I'll never forget the story and this is a true story of a lady that refused to discipline her child and she had this beautiful little girl that she just refused to discipline her because she didn't want to hurt her feelings or make her cry. Well, and so she never taught the daughter to mind her. So she was always running off in the grocery store, running off at the park and running off at home and running and doing what she wanted. And one day they're crossing a, a busy street. And she held her baby's hands to cross, and, and the, the, the little girl broke away, and she looked and saw that her daughter saw a little red ball across the street. And the little girl broke and ran after it, and the mother screaming for her to stop. But because she never taught that dog, that child, the importance of listening, that child ran out there and was crushed by a car. I'm trying to tell you, we need to start listening to what's being said, what the Bible says about, hey, there's a heaven, there's a, we need to wake up, we need to become accustomed to realize the alarm's being set. I gotta take it serious when the preaching goes forth. I gotta take it serious when we're worshiping it. Heaven and hell is trying to reach the Lord, shouldn't we? I, I, I believe this, if, if each and every one of us were permitted for a few moments to just glimpse hell for five minutes, five minutes, and come back. I believe the church of this size could evangelize the world in months. But until you're convinced, you'll be unconcerned. You see, because then we'd be convinced that there's a judgment and there's a finality to everything in a place called hell. And our greatest concern would not be all the distractions that we think and make so important. All see, some of you are dying to get on your phone, and right after church, right, before I'm even done, you'll be in the bathroom or you'll be on your phone to look at how many likes you got. And you'll be so concerned about that that it doesn't matter if someone is here desperately reaching for God or needing a move of God. And, and, and you fulfilled your obligation, you showed up, you sat in your seat, and it's just another service that doesn't really matter because you're not concerned. If we could glimpse hell, we'd start looking at the lost different. We'd start looking at everybody, at the little things that bother us, the little things that bug us. They wouldn't be there anymore. We'd be so worried. I gotta keep them out of hell. I, I don't care what they look like. I don't care how they. I don't care about the color of their skin. I don't care what they like. I don't care about their idiocy. I don't care. I don't care. I don't, care. I don't want anybody to go to hell. Understand that right here, right here, right, right here. There's a shift in society and the culture of a church. We're more concerned about the present than we are about eternity. Where let me just get through the day. Greater than any other sin or fault, weight in our of a Christian is the apathetic mentality towards eternity. Kind of a lukewarm. Eh, let me stop. The, the young preachers know. Don't you dare sit down during a church service. And then all of a sudden it's your turn to preach. You get up and you want everybody to jump and chow. Ask these guys that have to 
deal with pastor here because I'm we're not gonna have no phony blood. If you can't make it to prayer on time, you ain't gonna be. I don't care what your name is, who you. If you ain't got enough gumption to realize, we better take this serious. We better. I know some of y'all. You got your own little way of doing that. I don't give a rip about that. But if you can't do the basic. If you can't make it for prayer, if you can't teach a Bible study, if you can't knock a door, if you can't love the lost, you are one. And then I turn around, and I, what's wonderful about this church is I don't have to worry about a whole lot of that. We don't have a lot of sinfulness and strife and pride going on between families fighting one another. I got rid of all that. Hey, you ain't gonna do that. We got rid of all the Johnny come lately's. You ain't gonna survive here if, if you're a weak, self-promoting man. But if you're strong and you love God and you want to be righteous and, and do what's right, if you're right, you know full well, hey, this is the place to be. Not about how big and bad you are. You can be a little guy in stature and be powerful and anointing. You can be a uh, 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 be broke and still be on fire. You don't have to be eloquent to be anointed. You're on fire for what matters. You're concerned about heaven and hell. I refuse to turn church and Christianity to a place for life suggestions, self-improvement, self-help, life strategies for successful living. I'm talking about making it to heaven. I'm talking about consciously coming in here to get in contact with a holy God. It even says in the Bible, forsake not the assembling of ourselves together, even though there's something can happen in here. There's, uh, when we start getting concerned with one mind and one opponent, you're going to find the power of God poured out right here. I don't want to tell you how to be successful in the earth today. But I promise you, if you're living in a way to make the heaven, you'll still be successful here. He promises to bless. The Bible uses the term basket because wallets weren't a big thing back then. Do you know that you can bless your offspring, three and four generations beyond you by how you live and how you give today? Do you know that you can curse your offspring by how you live and yeah. give three and four generations? You see, some of us do a double fault to our families because we get stingy with God, thinking you're going to give your family more than God could. And so you live for yourself and you live for your family and you neglect the lost. You missed it. Yeah, you see, 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 see after, until you can deny yourself, you will never benefit yourself. You see, I'm living for God and being in the church isn't, isn't something that jives with our psychology today because we've been taught through Facebook and social media and all the cycle babble out there, hey, promote yourself. Sell yourself. That's why the whole prominent thing right now is called a selfie. So you say, well, I ain't got Facebook. It's a good thing because you, you, you do it pretty good all on your own, how great you are. Oh, you hear what I'm saying? Thank God, thank God you don't have a phone with filters. <laughs> well, because this concept leads to people losing out when things get hard. What? There's nothing, no greater testimony than being an amazing Christian when things are hard. Isn't, isn't that really where it's at? You see, when, when people realize that you're in this thing for more than just the bread and fish, you become the real. Mm. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Jesus is the one that said, what shall a profit a man if he shall gain the whole world and lose his own soul? Or what shall a man give in exchange for his soul? Don't misunderstand me. God is interested in you as a person today. 
God does want you to make it through. He does want you to be the head and not the tail, above and not beneath, but not at the cost of your soul. One writer said, before I was afflicted, I went astray. God is far more interested in where you're going to spend eternity than how you live today. Matthew 18, wherefore, if thy hand or thy foot offend thee, cut them off and cast them from thee. It is better for thee to enter into life, halt or maim, rather than having two hands or two feet to be cast in everlasting fire. The Bible says 10 times as much is about hell as it does about heaven. Are you preaching about hell today? Absolutely not. I'm preaching about avoiding it. God wants to keep us reminded there's a burden in hell. And we'll be so one as we realize I am concerned and I am convinced. Until you're convinced that people are lost, you'll never be a soul. You can't be his disciple until you're concerned about eternity. That's the greatest concern. We know that the man in hell was concerned. We know that heaven rejoices. There's a concern in the spirit world. So if the greatest concern of hell is to keep people out of hell, then surely our greatest concern ought to be to win people to keep them from going there. What's your greatest concern? What's for lunch? And I know some of you probably made some amazing dishes. Tomorrow's schedule, bigger barns. Luke 15 gives us, and I, I need to bring this too close, three parables. The parable of lost sheep, the lost coin, and the lost boy. All three teach us the love that God has for everyone, for all sinners. He's willing to save any sinner, no matter who they are or where you find them. Even the one that messed up and left on their own, but made the return. I just wonder how many Christians today need to return back to the Father's house with the right attitude and the right mentality. I wonder what kind of great joy will be in heaven over some sons that come back to the right thinking. The some daughters that come walking back to that altar today that maybe you've neglected. I wonder, I wonder if there'll be some joy in heaven. I wonder if some of your lost loved ones from years ago are going, yeah, preacher, tell them, tell them. <laughs> Listen, I don't want to hurt your feelings. Heaven's not going to applaud if you get that job. Heaven's not going to stand back in awe of the house that you got. Heaven's not checking your bank account and all up there getting going, look how good they're doing. Heaven doesn't peek at your achievements. I'm not going to sneak into your home office or the office. Of, how many accolades on the way? No. Heaven doesn't care how large or great your yard is. Now, that may bless you and your neighbors and make you feel good, but heaven don't care. Heaven won't bat an eye if your name's up in lights. If you have the most stuff. But we learn in all three cases, when that which was lost was found, when that which was lost came to its senses, there was great joy. All heaven rejoiced when the sinner gets saved. You know, listen, I believe that. You know what? I don't freak any of y'all out, but let me tell you why there's so much medication handed out today. We don't cast out devils no more. Don't get all spookified. Don't. I believe in praying for you. I don't ever read where heaven rejoices when we cast out devils. Sister Verdell, you, you know, there's some of us in here struggling with some illnesses. And I believe in healing. I can testify that it's worked. I've been healed before. But I don't ever read where all heaven rejoices when somebody gets healed. In fact, we just read earlier that it's better to ever enter into heaven maimed. And I may not be doing that today, but I like to preach good sermons. I, 
Uh, you know, so every, every pastor wants to feel he's accepted and that he's done a good job when, when it's over. Today may not be one of those days, but I don't ever read where heaven rejoices and said he did a good job because he preached a good sermon. In fact, I, I'm working on a message about an indifferent preacher that can reach the lost because when, 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 when the dude that was sent to Nineveh, what a lousy, rotten, stinking attitude and a horrible little, what, 68-word pathetic message that was indifferent whether you got right or not. I'm a little jealous of that joker because why do I got to spend so much time being caring and concerned? Think about that for a minute. You know, I may be tooting my own horn here, but I think you've done better than Jonah. I think we got better than Jonah. Brother... Brother Christian, you're better than a Jonah. Brother Joe, you're better than a Jonah. Ezekiel, you're better than a Jonah. I tell you, when you get up there, you may you may be slow to speak or you may be overexcited or super happy or whatever it is your stick is behind the pulpit, but we got a whole lot better than, than Jonah. And they got saved. They got right with God. Parents, don't let your kids beat you up because you ain't providing everything the neighbors do. Don't get in that competition. Be the best parent. You see, the things we shout about are important to us. But God never says we have to shout over it. The only thing I read in the word of God that heaven rejoices over is the salvation of a sinner. As we stand, and I haven't done that great of a job today, but soul winning ought to get you excited. It's because it's what's got you here. Reaching a new soul for God ought to light your fire in your life. So that ought, you ought to turn around and write, there's something awesome about being right with God. If you're in tune with heaven and its master, listen, you may not be able to cast out devils. You may not be able to lay hands on the sick and they recover. You may not be able to preach a good sermon or a lousy one. You may not be asked to cook at the church potluck. You, you may not be asked to bring your special dish. You, you, you know, you, you may not be someone that's asked to sing a special. You may not be able to do a lot of things. But there is one thing you can do that's greater than any of those. In fact, if you'll do that thing, all of heaven will join you and rejoice. If when you, when you leave here, you try to just reach one person with the gospel of Jesus Christ. If there's just something about you that you're willing to go and compel them and talk to them, hand out a card, smile, strike up a conversation, make it, invite someone for coffee, invite them, for, quit being so self-centered and so take up your cross, make it your mission to be concerned about the work of God because you're convinced that they need to be reached. I don't know what it was. I definitely know I wasn't worth the effort. Someone I didn't even know started working at my job. Started treating me. I didn't like being treated nice. I was an angry, embittered man who thought life had cheated him. Dealt with losing a dad as a teenager and mom couldn't handle me so I'm finding myself out on her ear long, long before I was able to take care of myself living in a lean to screwed to the side of a house basically homeless and helpless angry young man someone just reached out and started befriending me at work it made me mad I made his life miserable I'm glad he did. I'm glad he that all his years in living for God, being raised in church, he never lost what church really was. That's right. 
let me let me help you there's a day coming where I'm gonna be sitting down younger men are gonna be taking this spot I'm gonna be their greatest cheerleader Oh, there may be some little idiot things they do in my mind. I think I'm saying, you know what? I overlooked mine pretty good. Let me overlook theirs. Don't ever let me get so arrogant that I think I'm the answer and the end all. That I become so embittered that I no longer can worship and praise. I don't come to an office. I'm so worried about my image to them and not my image to God. You see, you can do something that not only pleases heaven today, but put hell's on, puts hell on its ear. Because there's someone screaming for you to reach a family member. That, there's someone there right and hanging. Oh, send someone. There's something you can do today that you should get excited over. Amen. You didn't maybe didn't sing today. You didn't preach today. You didn't, let me tell you what you can do today. Stir up that gift that is here. Become on fire about being what is really important to heaven and hell today. A soul winner. They're not going to check credentials. The lost person isn't going to say, let me see your credentials. Give me your preacher's. Did you sing Sunday for the pastor's birthday? They're not going to ask you that. But the most important, the most important position in the church, the most vital position, the most overlooked position the one that gives the greatest joy in heaven is that of a soul winner of all the things that I do the thing I want to zero in on is Lord never let me forget when I was the one that was lost and needed someone to love me never let me forget and how far you brought me that I needed someone to love me enough to give themselves to me. I know, I, I know. Remember, what it was like when you got in the presence of God. Remember how you feel, just love the deliverance. You want to be around the church all the time. You want to be with what Jesus is doing. Remember, remember, remember when, when, when the crazy man was delivered and wanted to be with Jesus, what Jesus asked him to do? Remember what he said? Go to your family. Go to your friends. Go to your... Go to your you see, you're going to be my hands. You're going to be my, my feet. You're going to be my love to this world. Can I ask you? I don't read one time in the Bible where God writes in there that says, you see Souls Harbor? You see those wonderful padded chairs they got? Hey, sinner, go to that church. That's never written in the Bible. But I read all over the place in the Bible that says, hey, church, go to the sinner. Go to the lost. Compel. Reach. Love. Go, 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 go. Go ye into all the world. 